depression is a condition of emotional shutdown. It is a habit that turns into a condition and then a state, if you like, of emotional suppression. I think it's going to be very important to, uh, to sort of immediately begin with uh, what is indeed the reason why you've come with a men-only event for Out of the Blue. My experience in the past is of doing um, men's emotional clearing work and what I've found is that when you're in a, a single sex environment, it, men are able to just let go and let the barriers down and, and access deeper issues than they would in mixed company. Yeah, because Lars, you've had experience of uh, working with men only events before, right? It's beautiful to see, as Kevin says, what happens when you actually, when there's only men in the room. And so with Out of the Blue, specifically addressing depression, uh, the question came pretty naturally to look at, okay, so would an Out of the Blue seminar be somehow different if there was only men in the room or for that matter only women in the room in another setting well, i mean I, th I think the point is that even in this non-binary age men and women from childhood you know when we're boys and girls we're conditioned quite differently and so the baggage we carry through life tends to be different of course there are similar themes with men and women but there are also these distinct different themes that we can approach uh, much more effectively with single-sex groups. So what sort of issues um, specific to men um, would get addressed then at this type of seminar? I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, issues like, um, as a man, I have to be the successful career guy and I don't have the freedom to pursue other things that could bring me more joy in life. Right. Or, uh, as a man, I need to be tough. I'm not allowed to feel and definitely not to express feelings because then people will think that I'm some kind of soft, uh, mushy type, you know. I mean, these are those typical things that so many of us carry and that would typically uh, come up here, I think, and how they are driving us into some kind of emotional illness, you know. Okay. And your experience of that, Kevin? There are a lot of uh, expectations for men to be uh, emotionally available, to be open, in some ways to be soft, but uh, at the same time, still the contrary expectations, so simultaneous and contrary expectations that, you know, we are stronger, bigger, tougher, can hold it together. I mean, both, both exist, and it's very confusing. We've been conditioned in ways that often have crosswired us internally, uh, made it difficult for us to see a clear path. We're not living in a time where uh, you know, the stereotypical male and female roles hold good anymore. And um, I think for, for a lot of men, it leaves us in a place of, of deep confusion, not, not just about what we've got to do, what our role is, but who we are in life. And that can definitely feed into to the, the themes of depression that Lars is addressing here. So um, important in this setting that, that um, he's working with men, men only because then these, these very specific issues can be, can be unearthed and cleared. Let's talk a little bit about um, depression then. Um, Kevin, you've, uh, you realized yourself that you were in a state of depression at some point. This was in my um, mid-teens. I would have been 16. And looking back through time, I can see that the, the roots of depression go back even earlier than that in, into my childhood, back to about the age eight. I can track them back. But I mean, I lived for, for numbers of years not knowing what depression was, knowing that my mother was diagnosed with depression, but you know, convincing myself, well, I'm not like her. I don't do what she does. I don't have the negative attitudes that she does. But sure enough, I, I ended up in a place of, of confusion and shutdown and, and kind of incapacitation in my mid-teens. The main help in those days was drugs, and I think the same way as they are today, you know, with, with medication. The drugs didn't do an awful lot. Uh, they... they barely touched me was was the truth of it. I worked through the circumstantial issues that were there at the time and kind of turned my life around, uh, but was left with the imprint that, that I mean, this was a hereditary thing that had been passed on to me. I really kind of uh, blanked out the diagnosis and just went my own, my own way very quickly and um, had these cyclical ups and downs into depression, driving through it getting angry with myself, getting focused on anything in life that I thought would change the way I felt about myself and life. Tried to 
kind of get motivated to do the things that I thought I needed to do to change the way I felt in life, to achieve the things I thought I needed to achieve, you know, in career, in family, with travel, with building the lifestyle, with accumulating the toys and the, the, the yeah, kind of yeah. the Play-Doh in life that I thought would make me feel better. It's when I realized nothing fundamental has changed in me or in my life. You know, I've got another toy, I've got another thing, I've achieved something else, but you know, it's still same me, same shit, same life, and it doesn't feel good. And I just went through cycles and cycles of this through my 20s, through my 30s, <laughs> and I turned up for a session, and it was the, the complete turnaround that I'd been looking for for decades at that point. I could feel that depression was no longer a part of me, was no longer in my cells that after doing this work, I was for the first time at peace at home in my own body. I'd never ever experienced that in life. You know, I was always looking for more, for next, for some enhancement that would pull me out of the, the state I was in. And since that time, zero, absolutely none. It was like depression was lifted out of my cells and some self-recognition, some being at peace with the way life is, with the way reality shows up, took its place. And so, you know, the drugs are not the only answer. I mean, they may do something for some people. There are enough of them being pres prescribed. We know this. But there are different answers, answers that can do what was, was done with me to reach in and to get to the root causes of depression and to resolve at that deep level. Because what I see around the world, the most frustrating thing is that virtually everyone's approach is some attempt to ameliorate the symptoms of depression, to make us temporarily feel better, to change our mood synthetically or by taking certain actions. I've, I've done, I did all that. I have done it for decades. It didn't make a fundamental difference. But if you can unearth the root causes of depression, and directly address those, mm -hmm. and that is absolutely possible to do, then the result can be complete freedom from depression. And that's what, uh, it's what I'm about, and I absolutely know it's what Lars is about as well. I'd like to add my own experience into that, Mark, if I may, because it, it okay. very much mirrors what Kevin is sharing uh, from a slightly different perspective. If we, if we go back to uh, the early 2000s, uh, my wife had been in, for 10 years, she'd been in a state of what was diagnosed as chronic uh, fatigue depression. Uh, she was literally more horizontal than vertical for those 10 years. And, and they'd been trying everything with her, drugs, therapies, and, and nothing helped. And then, just as you had a friend, Kevin, uh, she has a friend. There was a workshop, a weekend workshop up in Stockholm, which is a five-hour drive from here. And her friend came and, and picked my wife up in her car, drove her to Stockholm because she was in no shape to go anywhere herself. Mm. But, but uh, uh, Ulla took her to, to Stockholm to the workshop. And the woman who came home after that weekend was a changed person. Not that everything was rosy, pink, and shiny, but a total shift in perspective, a shift in mm, where am I in this and, and how can I... How can I actually somehow take command uh, and make decisions in my own life? And above all, what is this uh, tucking away of emotions and, and uh, trying to be the perfect one all the time? What does it cost me? And that was the start of her path, path back to, to being well. And she's never been back again either. Yes, it goes up and it goes down, uh, as all of us but never into illness again. There may also be other um, degrees of that in terms of stress or anxiety or people falling into burnout and so on. What, what are your um, experiences of, of people who've come to you as uh, looking for, for help, you know, who have these types of symptoms? There's a great similarity between these and, and depression. I think it helps to, to get clear in, in, in our context here, what depression is and what depression isn't, and then we can compare with those other, those other conditions, of the, those other states. Because the, the common mythology would tell us, you know, the way I was told as, uh, as a, a teenager, 
But depression is almost like a genetic inevitability that it's, it's um, uh, I mean, if it's in your family, it's going to be handed down to you in all likelihood. And the, the research since, uh, since the turn of the millennium has shown that's not, not the case. It doesn't work that way. Genetic inevitability, it, it, it just doesn't make sense for, for depression. Uh, circumstances, very, uh, very important. And the way we, we get conditioned by other people's attitudes and ideas, massively important as well. But the, the possibility exists to live depression-free no matter how much depression is around you. This is absolutely true. The other thing that I've heard over, over the years, and the thing I continue to hear more than anything else, is, uh, is that depression is a mental illness. And I want to state this categorically right here. Depression in itself is not a mental illness. Now, I want to be really clear about this because at its core, this is not a mental illness. And depression can cause mental illness. So depression can be a cause of mental illness. Right. Also, I've heard it said, depression is a physical illness. And the same thing applies here. There is no proof whatsoever that depression actually is a physical illness. What there's plenty of evidence to show is that depression, by its nature, by the way it works on, on mind and body, can cause physical illness. If you fall into serious depression, it affects pretty much every function in your body. It affects your endocrine system and so your, your hormonal production. It affects your digestive system. It affects your immune system. It affects your neurology. It affects I mean, pretty much every um, aspect of your, your physical functioning. For me, the causality is reversed. Depression is the cause of mental illness and of, of physical disease. So when we get clear about these things, we then need to ask, okay, what is depression? Depression is a condition of emotional shutdown. It is a habit that turns into a condition and then a state, if you like, of emotional suppression. And for a lot of us, our core management technique, if you like, when we're triggered with strong emotions, our core way to, to cope, to manage them, is to implode, is to shut down, is to uh, swallow back our emotions, to push them down inside our body, to go to sleep to them. And if that's our tendency, depression can be the result. If, if there is mild to moderate depression, then this work is, is extraordinary in getting in there and clearing this condition of shutdown and allowing some breath, allowing some, some levity, some lightness to, to take the place of the, the holding on that's been endemic with depression, the, the, the absolute necessity, it seems, to kind of keep things squeeze down inside. I think it's sad and, uh, and that also um, depression can uh, present itself not only in a sense of um, deflation and, and people who are withdrawn drawn within themselves um, suffering in that way, but also through hyperactivity so that, is a, that it works as a mask in a sense. Is, is yeah, I think, I think then we're leading back into the burnout uh, conversation, Mark, which, uh, which I didn't, didn't address fully here. Um, for some of us, yes, we suppress our emotions and we keep things under wraps. You know, we choke them back, swallow them down. It leads directly into, directly into depression. Right. For some of us, we've got different strategies of managing our emotions when we're heavily triggered, you know. Yeah. Some of us go into um, flight modality and we're, we're kind of distracting. We're all over the place, getting busy, 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 and um, kind of act, acting things out in, a, in, a, in a, an energetic or superficially energetic way. And right. that's exhausting. And right. it takes coming to the exhaustion to then collapse again to enter into depression. Otherwise, we're in some sort of, um, you know, we could be in anything from a reverie to like desperately reaching to find whatever it is we're looking for in life. But it takes coming to the end of that, or the, you know, it could be a temporary end, but, but being exhausted by it to collapse back into depression. So burnout, for sure, it's, it's a similar situation to depression. It's manifesting in a different way. It's caused by a slightly different form of unhealthy emotional management, but this work can, can deal with that only equally effectively. How do you mention this, Kevin? Because, I mean, yeah. this, this obviously is something that we explore in the seminar, is these different, you know, surface behaviors. Yes. What is actually driving them and, and what, what, what leads to depression and what leads to other versions of emotional unhealth. So, yes, this is, this is a core part of the seminar. Sure. Um, the, the third element, Mark, and we've talked about, you know, the, the flight response, the overreacting, the pretend 
I do nothing, nothing touches me, I'm fine, and I'm just being hyper busy, not noticing what's taking place under the surface until we burn out and it's a bit, bit late, you know, we need help at that point. The third way that we manage our emotions is by blocking them, shutting them down, holding on to them, having a lot of, lot of rules in place to go, you know, it's got to be this way, I've got to be better at it, and we get very uh, self-critical, self-judgmental, maybe critical and judgmental of others, but we lead a tense life. And this tends to come with a lot of anxiety. And so this kind of um, rigid approach to managing emotions, this, this kind of you know, barricaded version can actually feed into depression and create anxiety depression. If, the, if people come to one of your seminars and in one way or another have um, a form of uh, are using drugs to suppress whatever it is that they are dealing with, um, is it still effective for them if they are... Mm. Under some form of uh, no. Mm -hmm. Can it work? Yes. Does it work? It depends on the individual. Is is the is the truth? Um, the work is predicated on stopping and saying, okay, we, what is it I'm actually feeling here? And let's tell the truth about that. Let's open with that. Let's feel that, and let's let's explore where that where that leads us. I heard the word um, trauma um, mentioned, and I was wondering when that was going to come up because um, we often hear of trauma also as being one of those aspects that is close to the source of depression. Um, in what ways does the journey method um, compare with other tools and techniques that are often uh, out there, put out there for, uh, for people to help deal with trauma? It, it's a good question, Mark. I mean, I'm not an expert in, in all modalities. And what I've witnessed with, with other approaches is that one of two things happen, that people... Um, attempt to either talk their way through a circumstance to explain it away rationally over a period of time or to reframe it to attach different meaning to it so that the the emotional potency hopefully subsides over time and both of these things can have their value there's no doubt with the journey we approach more directly we encourage people to open fully emotionally to um, to embrace whatever they've shut down to in the past. And we've got a huge number, a variety of techniques that help people to do that in a step-by-step -step way. The main difference is our goal here in a relatively short period of time is to come to completion with the issue, to come to more than acceptance, to come to, to forgiveness of what has taken place. Forgiveness is a massively healing force. Mandela said that holding on to resentment is like swallowing poison and hoping your enemy will die. So yes, a very very similar thing here. And um, I mean, the, the antithesis of that, of course, is that letting go and coming to forgiveness is not letting someone else off the hook. It's actually letting yourself off the hook. What most people don't teach us is how to do that. They just say, "Well, forgive," and we don't know. I mean, most of us. I mean, you know, the truth is, we get to the point of making it okay, and we can mouth forgiveness, maybe. But it's not, it's not true, it's not deep, it's not authentic forgiveness. And that level of deep and authentic forgiveness is what makes the fundamental difference in, in turning our lives around. What, is, um, you know, what has been your finding in yourself? What have you found in yourself that has uh, shifted, changed? One of them is judgment. Uh, I could spend a lot of time in, in looking at other people and their actions and all kinds of aspects of them and going, yeah, well, you know, better or worse. or And, and above all, comparing to seeing where am I in relation to them. Uh, always important to, to make sure that, they're, that I was somehow um, better. And I don't feel that happening very much in my life these days because uh, I get it that that was just a strategy to somehow keep me safe from having to feel that I'm inferior or, or that I'm, you know, in other aspects, uh, flawed. Right. So uh, I say that that's a key thing for me, actually. And another key thing is um, giving myself permission to feel and to show it. Because I, I, I actually, I, you know, I lived by the traditional values, even though I wasn't even aware of it, uh, that um, I needed to be strong and brave and tough and all these things, you know, and to the point where I would push stuff down and, uh, yeah, it would, it, you know, it would be an ache in the gut and it would be uh, hugely... Um, draining in energy and in mood, and I would still continue to do it. And, and these days, 
I, you know, if, if, if stuff comes up, uh, I'm not going to go around raging, raging at people. But I will acknowledge to myself whatever comes up and to honor that instead of just making it wrong, to accept that, okay, that's where I am right now and, and allowing that to be. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's a more peaceful place to be in for me. I don't know that I'm ever nervous in meeting people these days, regardless of if it's just one or if it's 500, <laughs> because there's nothing to hide. Uh, right. I don't feel that I need to bring a mask or a role and, and to come across a certain way. Uh, I'm okay with just being me. And if somebody um, gets challenged by that or, or even laughs, it's okay. Yeah, for, for me, Mark, on a similar theme here, I think that the big difference is that years ago, I used to wake up every morning, either consciously or unconsciously, trying to figure out what I needed to do that day to make life better. And it never ultimately got better, was the truth, you know? There were swings one direction or the other direction, but no fundamental shift. I was always seeking something that was out of my reach and was dissatisfied with the life I was living through to being in distinct pain with the way I was living. And for nearly a quarter of a century, I've woken up every morning with gratitude for what is. I'm deeply happy at peace with the way life is even with its ups and downs, you know, I recognize that still, you know, when, when life gets intense in ways that I don't, don't particularly appreciate, that I'm actually okay with that. I'm ultimately not affected by the, the swings on the, the barometer, if you like, that, that I'm essentially positive, whereas I experienced myself as essentially negative previously. So I, I genuinely, I wake up just wondering what the day has got in store. I'm wanting, obviously, to engage. I've got more energy. I've got more passion. I've got more direction. Life holds more meaning. It feels purposeful. None of those things were, were evident. They, they didn't even seem possible in my, in my life previously. And they're a natural part of life now. So it's been, been a complete turnaround for me. I'm living a life that I could not have imagined 25 years ago is the, the, the honest truth of it. Have there been occasions when, you know, when trauma indeed has still happened in your life in the past 25 years, you know, how have you then coped with it, that it hasn't turned back into what it was? Yes, trauma has happened, bereavement has happened, major relationship issues have happened in that time. And yet using the understanding, the realisation, the techniques that I learned through the journey has allowed me to stay open for the issues to burn through, to come to completion as they're happening lifetime. And then in that, I'm mean, coming to, to resolution and moving forward productively and positively in life. It's given me a completely different uh, perspective and tool set. The question is, what do you infer from that and how do you deal with it? How do you handle it effectively and move forward? And that's a part of what Lars will be teaching. Obviously, there are going to be uh, men who, who may, feel, may feel drawn to this seminar, um, who are facing the, the issue in themselves of, of acceptability around this subject of you know, not being able to cope, right? Depression, anxiety, whatever it may be. What advice would you have for men who are facing... It, it is a distinct problem, Mark, because we are expected to be stoic, to carry the burden, to be in control, to be strong emotionally as well as physically, it leads to more denial in men than in women. And I think this is why we see much more uh, depression-related suicide, particularly in certain countries, with men than, than with women. And this work is for people who are willing to both recognize that there is something going on in their lives that is outside their control and they need help with and who are willing to get real emotionally and so you know, there's the invitation if both of those things apply to you then this really can help genuinely can help but it does it does rely on your own willingness to explore your willingness to be truthful to right. stop the game playing the facades the 
you know, the macho masks that all of us wear from time to time of, you know, got my shit together, nothing wrong here, you know, just uh, move on by. I mean, yeah. many of us, I did that for decades, so I'm not pointing a finger here. I did it for decades. So, you know, people around me didn't really know that I was depressed. They knew that I was moody, but they didn't know that I was depressed uh, because the facade was, you know, yeah, got it. You know, I'm handling this, figuring this out. Doing it my own way is the only, the only ultimate thing, you know. And underneath that, I mean, the truth was I was was hopeless. I'm mean, often in helplessness and not able to name it, not willing to go there. So it's for men who've got more emotional honesty than I had back in the day. It's for men who are willing to say, yes, I, you know, something's wrong. I recognize I need help. And I'm willing to play my part in that. Rather than expect someone else to fix me, I'm willing to be proactive in the process of turning this around. And if that includes being I mean, emotionally open, then so be it. It's for those people. I mean, when you're in the kind of situation that Kevin's describing, you're always paying a price. You're always losing out on something. That could probably be a very good place to be in to decide to actually to get this work done, to attend one of these seminars, and to, to really give yourself a, an honest chance to discover the unhealthy parts that can be cleared, you know. Last, maybe it's good to just talk a little bit um, about the uh, event. It's uh, pretty easily accessible from from Germany, from the Netherlands, from from those parts of Europe, and that's that's the main target group we have uh, this time around. The team that's working with this, uh, together with me, in this is the team at Conscious Leadership Coaching, and they're Dutch, they're German. They're Swiss, and we're working together to organize this. Uh, it is residential, right? The reason for that is, is what? Is, it, uh, is there a specific reason? When you're at a residential event, you get all that space to reflect with each other, uh, you know, at dinner and in the evenings, etc. And if you're sharing a room with someone, you may uh, decide that you want to, to share more than the room. You may want to talk with each other as well and, and share experiences. So there is an added value in, in um, that format, I would say. I mean, we're starting Friday evening with dinner together, and then we have an evening session. And by the time we're done with that session, it'll be time to go to bed. So it's good to not have to get in the car and drive a, an hour somewhere else. Instead, we have our rooms there. And, and it'll be a full day, including evening session on Saturday too, and then a full day on, on Sunday. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a good format to keep us all together and to make sure that these long days work without draining us completely, you know. Is there any um, sort of final word that you want to say about the, uh, the event, that, uh, a recommendation, a, a, uh, a point of action that uh, you want to recommend to people? Let, let me say something here, Mark, because uh, first, first of all, I think it's important for people to know that this work has been helping people to free themselves from depression since 1994, so 25 years. There have been thousands, tens of thousands around the world who've successfully used the work and, and got the results they were looking for. And with Lars, they'll be working with someone who has huge heart, deep integrity, and is, is steeped in the experience of this work. They'll be in excellent, excellent hands with, with him. And so I can't recommend it enough. If they are the type of people with the courage to recognize something isn't working in their life and with the courage to, to just stop and get real, then Lars is, is a phenomenal facilitator. He's a, a beautiful man, deeply insightful, deeply wise. They, they'll be in great, great hands with him. The biggest recommendation we can ever give is to say, it worked for me. It yeah. fundamentally changed my life. Yeah. Can we guarantee that we'll do that for everyone else? No, we can't, because it depends on the way they participate. And is it likely that it will help in the same or similar way? Absolutely. So our recommendation is not theoretical. Our recommendation is based on direct experience of this depth of turnaround in our life. And I think that's the most valuable recommendation you can give. This book you've written, uh, Light in the Heart of Darkness, um, obviously uh, goes right to the core of this, this very issue. Um, there are um, 
there are, uh, I believe, uh, places where you can uh, get a hold of this book and, uh, and also do some of the exercises in it. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. The book was written from my direct experience, Mark, in the same way as I was describing earlier on. This is not um, a book written from theory about what might happen. It's, it's written from direct experience of what happened to me and what has happened for a huge number of, of other people. Uh, the work is practical work. The work is listed out in the book. It's available in the book. Um, if people want a hard copy of it, they can go on to various forms of Amazon. Uh, I think it's published in Dutch as well, actually, and I don't know the uh, the Dutch uh, equivalent of, of Amazon. There's a book distributor in, in Holland where you can get uh, you can get the hard copy of the book. If people want this in English in ebook then they can get it free on my website, and that's kevinbillet.org. So K-E-V-I-N-B-I-L-L-E-T-T dot org. Um, it's available as a free e-book, e and the work is, uh, is also available in aud audio format, so they can download that from the site. They can use... All of the exercises that I use, they can use, I mean, practice a little bit before they get to Lars and, and see what happens with uh, with doing the, the work prior to the, them getting to the workshop. You know, it, it, it helps. But the tools they need, they're all available. They're available in the workshop. They're available in the book. What I'd say is it's it's a more direct route to go to the workshop because you get hands-on uh, help, help from people with experience, help from people who've been through similar things. You get that level of support, and they help you with the, the, the exercises. So it's uh, it's a potent way to, to start to work and to, to begin to really clear the fundamentals of depression.